Hello everyone, my name is Renee Long, one of the social media specialists and webinar coordinators here at the American College of Healthcare Sciences. Joining me today behind the scenes for all our technical needs is Dominic Aiello, the other social media specialist and webinar coordinator here at ACHS. Today we'll be hosting a free webinar on homeopathy with Dr. Tim Dooley. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Dooley, and welcome everyone to our webinar. And just a few housekeeping items before we get started. You may have noticed that your line has been muted. We are recording today's webinar and this helps ensure we can clearly hear our presenter. You'll also notice that you have a control panel at the right hand side of your screen. If you have a question you would like to ask Dr. Dooley during the Q&A at the end of the webinar, go ahead and type it into the questions box. We will have a 10 minute Q&A period at the end of the webinar, so if you have questions as we go, go ahead and type them into the questions box at the bottom of your control panel and Dr. Dooley will do his best to get to all of your questions. If you have further questions that require a bit more research, please feel free to follow up with our presenter directly through email, and he's happy to respond to all of your questions, but please be sure to give him some time to get back to you, and we'll go ahead and send his email through the chat screen. And now, I'll go ahead and turn the webinar over to our presenter, who will give a brief introduction and then begin the lecture. Welcome, Dr. Dooley. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, the title of today's webinar is a carrot, not a stick. I hope you can see my screen there. And I am, as she said, Tim Dooley. I'm both a naturopathic doctor and a medical doctor. Since the question always comes up, let me digress for a minute and explain how that happened. Actually, the first thing I learned about, other than regular medicine, when I was a, uh, a college student was homeopathy. I was reading a yoga book called Discourses on Mahabharata by P.R. Sarkar and uh, it had a section called Health Healthcare of, of that era and he was talking about how uh, thousands of years ago in the time of Krishna that they used um, this this principle of similars but it was not developed into a science until Samuel Hahnemann German physician in the early 1800s I was completely intrigued. I had never heard of any system of medicine other than conventional medicine. Um, sh I was a pre-med student at the time and shortly after that I met a student who went to the Na National College of Naturopathic Medicine and it turned out to be the only school in America at the time that taught homeopathy. So my first choice was to go there and find out about it. So that's why I went first to National College, graduating from there in 78. Um, and I read, kind of specialized in homeopathy in my private practice as a naturopath. I was in Southern Oregon, and at that time, in the late 70s, the medical profession was extremely antagonistic to uh, alternative health care, you could say. And uh, as the years went by, I finally went, what do these guys know that I don't know? Why are they so rude and uptight? So different changes happened in my life and the opportunity came up to go back to school. So I went back to a conventional medical school, uh, attending Oregon Health Sciences University School of Medicine there in Portland and graduating in 89. Um, but my main interest was still homeopathy and that's what I've come back to. Um, I've written many articles and one book, Homeopathy Beyond Flat Earth Medicine, which if you're interested, you can read the, the first edition for free online uh, on my website. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my basic background of who I am and how I got interested in homeopathy. Um, if you want to get an animal to move, you can either hit them with a stick or attract them with a carrot. Everybody knows this. Uh, it's a... Uh, um, a, an analogy for many things in life here. But it actually is also a very good analogy explaining the difference between homeopathic medicines and a person's response to them and conventional medications. Conventional medications are like the stick. They force a change in everyone every time. Homeopathic remedies are more like carrots. They elicit a response without forcing a change. And I think everyone's sort of intuitively in touch with this on the conventional medicine, medicine side at least. Um, that's, you know, you're forcing a change. That's why there's so many side effects. The body has no choice but to respond to these high doses of medications which, which are uh, imposed on it. So a stick will always make a change. But the trick with homeopathy is you need the correct carrot, the right incentive, 
to get a response. For example, if you were to put a carrot in front of a tiger, not much is going to happen. But if you put a carrot in front of, say, a rabbit or a goat, they're going to walk. They're going to be interested and they're going to walk over. So that's the trick with homeopathy, is that you have to find the, the individual remedy that that person will respond to. So how is that done? An effective homeopathic remedy, that is the right carrot, is found by looking at the whole person, not just their disease. I guess you could say that this is done by looking at the symptoms of the patient. Um, in conventional medicine, you treat the disease of the patient, but in homeopathic medicine, it's not, it's accurate to say you actually treat the patient who has the disease. You really treat diseases indirectly by treating the patient as a whole. Um, the concept of doing this in conventional medicine does not exist. In conventional medicine, you always treat a disease. You identify a disease and you treat it. This kind of, this dates back, it's, it's a natural sort of an way to do it. But that's why my book, Homeopathy Beyond Flat Earth Medicine, that's what it's responding to, is that you appear to be treating the patient when you treat their diseases, but you're really not. But in homeopathy, you actually treat the person, and they respond, and their own body throws off the disease. So the patient is a, as a whole is treated by looking at the symptoms of the patient as a whole. And in conventional medicine, symptoms not related to the disease are mostly ignored. Um, when a person has an illness, they respond by manifesting symptoms throughout their person, so to speak. Um, for example, if somebody has an, we'll take a simple example, if somebody has an upper respiratory infection, say, they not only have a cough, but they'll have, depending on the person, they may have very many different types of coughs. Furthermore, some people may be thirsty, some people have no thirst, some people are very chilly and want to be wrapped up, other people feel better out in the open air. All of these sorts of things are completely ignored in conventional medicine because once you've established the disease diagnosis, all of these peculiarity, uh, peculiarities of the patient have no purpose, they have no function, they're just noise, so to speak. But this is where the gold is when you're treating somebody homeopathically. This is where you find out how to help them, it is by looking at the other symptoms. The disease name is, is only somewhat helpful, is only somewhat helpful in homeopathy. Um, let me go into more detail on this. Consider somebody with a cough. Okay, so coughs, most people who have coughs, they have a viral illness, maybe they have allergies, sometimes they have asthma, sometimes they have some bacterial process going on. Now, obviously, as a former emergency room doctor, you know, we think about things like foreign bodies and chemical irritation, and sometimes people have cancer and the growth is, is pushing on their airways, causing a cough, or even psychological things, and other things like that. But, but the great majority of people who have a cough, it's going to be viral or allergic or asthmatic or bacterial. So, in conventional medicine, once the diagnosis is made, you know, various sticks are prescribed to kind of force the body to relieve the symptoms. Um, you know, for example, uh, if it's a bacterial type illness, you give an antibacterial. You know, if the person's congested, you might give an anti-congestant, right? Something to force the congestion to go down, to decrease the secretions in the lungs, etc. If the person's coughing, it's irritating them, so you give them a cough suppressant, something, an anti-cough, something to make their cough go away. You know, the inflammation is there. Maybe uh, that's causing a lot of the irritation, causing the cough. So you give an anti-inflammatory. You know, the antis, they're all their sticks. They're all forcing changes in the body. But like I said before, most of the patient's symptoms, uh, especially relating to their whole person, are completely ignored. For example, um, cough modalities. 
let me talk about that for a second so you know what I mean. Modalities are very important in homeopathy. Some people have a cough and you always ask in homeopathy, well, what makes you cough? What causes your cough? What stimulates your cough? Sometimes it's, oh, gee, every time I drink something cold, it makes me just go into a coughing spasm. Or every time I talk, or every time I lie down, I can't stop coughing. I have to, I have to sleep sitting up. Or maybe every time I get a draft of air, I just start hacking my head off. And on the flip side, those very things might make it better on somebody else. But hey, every time I walk outside, I feel, I, I feel much better. I stop coughing, and it feels really good. Or um, every time I have to lay down is, uh, to relieve my cough, every time I sit up, I start coughing my head off, etc. So these modalities, so that's what modalities means, things that make, make a symptom better or worse. Then general symptoms means things that affect the person in general. This is also an important concept in homeopathy, and more important than, than the d disease diagnosis when it comes to treating the patient. Um, general symptoms are things like how the person feels in general. Um, are they hot or are they cold? Um, um, are, they, are, they, are they agitated? Are they restless? Or are they lethargic? These are, these are general kinds of symptoms and general presentations. Things, things regarding the person as a whole, or in general, so to speak. And then psychological changes. These are also extremely important in homeopathy. For example, you'll see some people, and they're so irritable. They've got an upper respiratory infection. They're so irritable. You know, you open the window and a little draft of air comes in. They're like, close that window. You know, they just can't help it. They just snap at you. And that's one Psycho, their, their nervous system has a certain irritation which suggests certain homeopathic remedies that might help. There's other people who are just completely indifferent. You know, they're sick. You can, you know, start a motorcycle next to them. They're completely indifferent. They, they're, they're not going to notice. They're not going to care, um, etc. So it's these other symptoms that usually indicate what care will work. Like I said, this is where the gold is found in homeopathy. So the point is, it's the whole person that responds to a disease influence, not just the part. And this whole person response is reflected in their whole symptoms. Now, let's be a little more specific here. The word homeopathy means similar suffering. Okay, Homo means similar, you know, homogenized milk, it's all one stuff. And pathos means suffering. So homeopathy means similar suffering. And what this means is that the symptoms that a substance can cause in a healthy person can be cured in an ill person by that same substance. Or in other words, like cures like. Um, I think people probably have a pretty good understanding of what I mean by that. In other words, a substance, for, exa for example, a commonly used one is um, coffee. You know, coffee makes people very awake and sort of mentally alert. And so some people who have insomnia, where they have, they have that same kind of mental awakeness and alertness, ho homeopathic coffee can actually make their mind calm down and they can go to sleep. Like cures like. I remember years ago one of my patients uh, saying to me, uh, I, I always ask, well, do you know anything about homeopathy? And, and one woman said, yeah, homeopathy is it's using the hair of the dog that bit you. And uh, bit you. So uh, and another way of saying like cures like, so to speak. OK. So how this is done in homeopathy is you're going to match the symptoms of the whole person that can be caused by the substance with the symptoms spontaneously expressed in an, Ill per, in an ill person. And then that substance is then used therapeutically as a medicine. So for good results in homeopathy, you always do that. You always stand back and look at the whole person. I mean, there are a few fairly specific things in homeopathy, um, like arnica, you know, homeopathic arnica. A lot of people are familiar with arnica. Arnica is made from a a uh, plant that grows kind of in the mountainous areas 
and it's extremely good for things like bruises and falls. You know, if, if you take it enough to get symptoms from the substance itself, you get this sore, bruised feeling in your body. And arnica is so specific for bruises that, you know, lots of mothers of toddlers carry arnica in their uh, purse or whatever, so that when their kid inevitably falls over and whacks himself, they can give him a dose of arnica, and he can get well much faster and have much less bruising. Um, in fact, every year I hear about more thing, more uh, practitioners such as plastic surgeons who are starting to use arnica as part of their post-operative care because it really is so straightforward. I kind of think of as think of it as the entry drug in homeopathy. Um, where people use it and they see, wow, this stuff really works, uh, and it gets them interested in it. So any substance that can cause symptoms in a person can be used as a homeopathic medicine. The question is, how are you going to do that? You know, two problems come up here. One, how do you know uh, what symptoms can be caused by a substance in detail and how do you apply a toxic substance to the medicine without making the patient worse. Like I said, anything can be used as a homeopathic medicine. You can use venoms, you can use toxins, you can use poisons, but you, you use them in a non-toxic way that I'll get to in a few minutes. Um, these questions were addressed when home homeopathy was started by the German physician Samuel Hahnemann. Now here's a st here is the uh, statue of Hahnemann in Washington, D.C. I'm going to digress for a few minutes here and uh, talk about the statue and, and many of the things that it suggests uh, historically uh, about the life of Hahnemann as well as just the fact that it's there in Washington, D.C. You know, this statue, to the best of my knowledge, is the only statue, monument, dedicated to a physician in America. I think Oliver Wendell Holmes was a Supreme Court justice and was a physician, and there, there's a statue of him somewhere, but that's because he was a Supreme Court justice, not because he was a physician. This monument, when it was dedicated June 21st, 1900, was, is within sight of the White House. And indeed, many dignitaries were there at, it, at its inauguration, its dedication that day, including the President of the United States, William McKinley. Um, the point is, homeopathy was huge. In 1900, they make the statue, the President of the United States comes, at that time, about one in four physicians in America identified themselves as a homeopath. There were homeopathic medical schools, there were homeopathic hospitals. Homeopathy was a very big deal. Um, I'll come back to what happened to homeopathy in America in a little bit, but let me look at a few other features here on this statue because it's instructive. First of all, Hahnemann's sitting there in his sort of scholarly pose with some robes on. And beneath him, I don't know if you can read it, but it says similia similibus curentur, which means by similars, similar things are cured. In other words, like cures like. That's the Latin form of that. Um, then it has these base relief, bronze, I think they're called base relief um, pictures, kind of going from left to right here. And these are supposed to be scenes from Hahnemann's life here. Um, Hahnemann was a brilliant student. Uh, he was born in 18, 15, 1755, to the best of my memory. And um, he, at a very young age, was able, despite the fact he was from a relatively poor family, was able, because of his you know, super intelligence, was able to secure a position and get educated and even become a doctor at, at quite a young age. Um, I've heard him referred to by critics of homeopathy as a medical pr prodigy. Um, even though they didn't support homeopathy and didn't think it didn't work, they recognized that Hahnemann really was a great scientific personality, you could say. Um, and I think that I think it shows him. I can't see it very well. I think the one on the left shows him laboring away as a student, and then he's getting some sort of award in the second one. Um, 
Hahnemann, though, as he, when he grew up and started practice, uh, became a physician, he didn't really like medicine in the sense that it hurt people. He could see it hurt people. He could see it wasn't rational. And so instead of being a practicing physician's, physician, he chose, I guess, what would now be called an academic career. Um, he had a very itinerant life. He moved here and there with his wife and family and uh, did different jobs, but mostly he spent much of his life translating and writing medical texts. Hahnemann spoke a great many languages. The least number I've ever seen um, credited to him is seven languages. I've seen up to 14 that he spoke fluently, supposedly, but at least seven. And he would translate medical and scientific texts in Europe from one language to another. Um, so he did this for the bulk of his early career, uh, some 20, 20, 25, 30 years he did this. So at the end of that, he was absolutely at the forefront of science and medicine for all of Europe. He, he arguably knew more about the scientific literature, uh, many branches of science, um, than anyone else who was alive at that time. Um, he even wrote the the textbook, which was used by apothecaries in the apothecary profession. Uh, later in his career, he I don't know of his where he initially ran across it. I've heard different stories, but he came across this idea of using similes to cure diseases, and he eventually did an experiment with Peruvian bark, which is also sometimes called China. Its Latin name is Cinchona officinalis. And the reason he used that is because this substance has quinine in it and it would actually cure uh, malaria. It was one of the few substance, the few medical substances at that time which was actually curative. So Hahnemann, to test this theory, he took large, larger doses of Peruvian bark for a period of days and developed symptoms as a result in reaction to it. And he recorded his symptoms and concluded that, at least for that substance, it most certainly was true, that the symptoms which he developed were very similar to the symptoms which he found in patients with um, malaria. So late in his life, Hahnemann um, started developing homeopathy as a science. Uh, I, you know, I think he was in his 50s before he really got rolling, and that was at a time, I think, when the average lifespan was about 48 years or something. He was kind of an old guy already. Um, Hahnemann took a position at a medical school, I don't know, it was late 50s or age 60, somewhere around there, and he became famous for being able to empty out an entire lecture hall because he would offend everybody. At that time, you know, conventional medicine was not really very rational. Um, they were doing a lot of bloodletting, they would use extremely harsh doses of substances on their patients and cause lots of problems, and Hahnemann would just trash them. He would just tear them to pieces. Uh, he would explain to them how they're killing people, how this was completely irrational. And at that time, the medical profession was, uh, as it has been through most of its history, an extremely sort of egotistical profession. People would just stomp out. But some people would stay. And some people were swayed by him. And they started to experiment with his system of medicine. Um, now we'll get back to those two questions in just a second. I'll just mention one more thing while I'm on this slide about what happened to homeopathy in America here. Because homeopathy was huge in 1900 and by 1940 you, you, it's, it's very small. What happened was is that in the early 1900s, well, I think it was 1906, 1908, there was a Flexner report um, which was a investigation of medical schools that, uh, that I believe was reported to Congress, which established that there was no good system, systematic way of teaching medicine and that um, medical schools needed upgrading. So it became official policy that certain things had to be taught in medical schools in a certain way. Um, and this went somewhat against the homeopathic grain, so to speak. It created a mentality which which that this way of approaching health was the right way to approach health, so to speak. But what really hit homeopathy hard here in America was the development of antibiotics and improved surgical techniques. Um, all of a sudden, you could, with much, much more easily than practicing homeopathy, you could cure these rather dramatic diseases 
um, and you could actually do surgery surgery on people uh, in a way that was relatively painless, etc. So it became oh, it, it was it was quite an improvement over the over the conventional medicine which had preceded it, and there was just a great a great joy and rush to go into that type of medicine. And homeopathy, which is harder to practice, requires more training. Um, just that kind of started to peter out. And by the 1960s, there were very few homeopaths, uh, and then things started to pick up again in the 70s uh, here in America. So let's get back to the subject at hand here that I digressed from. So Hahnemann, to establish the symptoms that a substance could, could cause, started um, studies, which he called provings. And these established the effects and therefore the therapeutic range of medicines. So in other words, he would give people substances in high enough doses that they would get symptoms. And then they would record, they would carry books around with them and they would record all of their symptoms um, that happened. But he did something completely brilliant. He recognized that substances affect persons on all levels and he considered the whole person. So from day one, he recognized that that a, that each substance has a unique presentation in all parts of the body and in all parts of the human experience. And so he would have people record their mental symptoms, their dreams, whether they were hot, whether they were cold, um, as well as pains and feelings they would get through their body and all of the modalities associated with it. Now, the fact that medicines can cause symptoms throughout the whole person is well recognized in conventional medicine. But they used a euphemism that we're all familiar with called side effects to describe these unwanted effects. But they're not really side effects. They're just effects. They're just unwanted effects. I mean, one of the most dramatic in the course of my life is, is uh, thalidomide which was given to women to, you know, as a stick, pregnant women to force them not to have nausea, but it caused phocomelia, as it's called, these extremely foreshortened limbs, and it was extremely teratogenic. It caused a lot of birth defects, and so as soon as this was recognized, of course, it was taken off the market. And I can't remember what it's been brought back for now. It's been brought back for something else. And um, they just, you know, had extremely strict rules about not giving it to, to uh even a potentially pregnant woman. Um, but uh, that's not really... Okay, so Hahnemann also developed a system of dilution whereby the toxicity of substances is lost, but they still retain their therapeutic capacity if they're made according to a system. Um, this is extremely important because some of the most useful homeopathic medicines are actually toxic substances. For example, arsenic. Arsenic is a classic example. Um, arsenic causes a great many symptoms in the body. Yeah, this is interesting because my grandfather, Earl Dooley in Idaho, became rather famous because he was the county chemist and he solved the he he caught a serial murderer and uh, had them convicted of murder by by testing for arsenic. This woman was marrying men getting insurance policies and then giving them um, arsenic and they would always be diagnosed as having some sort of typhoid because the symptoms of arsenic were very similar to the symptoms of typhoid. The type of diarrhea they would get, how they would feel, they would go to the doctor to be diagnosed with typhoid and gee, unfortunately they died. But in homeopathy where people are spontaneously expressing those symptoms, you can use homeopathic arsenic in a super dilution in which there's actually no arsenic left. Let's get to that and explain how this is done. In the system of dilution, a single drop of a substance is diluted with 99 drops of water and then vigorously agitated. So this is called 1C dilution. 1C C means centesimal or 100. So this is, you know, it's a 1 to 100 dilution. Then if you take a drop of the 1C, add it to 99 drops more water, and vigorously agitate it again, this is the 2C dilution, or the 2 centesimal dilution. 
of note is that, so the 1C dilution is 1 in 100. The 2C dilution is 1 in 10,000. There are four zeros then. Etc. So the dilution, the dilutional factor goes up extremely quickly when you dilute this way. It also has to be pointed out that it must be vigorously agitated each step of the way. If it's not agitated, you just end up with a dilute substance. You don't end up with the homeopathic remedy. That somehow it doesn't work unless you bang it. You, you know, Hahnemann would describe pounding it uh, against some sort of surface for uh, for some period of time, so that the water, uh, so that the dilution would be proper properly made. Now, of note here, and this is something Hahnemann was completely aware of, around the 12C dilution, there is statistically none of the original substance remaining in the diluent. Okay, the diluent here meaning the water used for dilution and agitation. So from the 12C dilution on, Statistically, actually it's usually even going to happen before that, but statistically from 12 on, there's none of the original substance left. And yet, potencies of 30C, 200C, and above are routinely used in homeopathy with success. Okay, because the original substance is effectively diluted out of the water in the production of remedies. It is the water itself which is cons which is changed and becomes the medicine. So in homeopathy, you're actually creating something new when you create homeopathic dilutions. You're changing the diluent into a medicine. I always think of it as almost like a photographic negative. I, I, I know that sounds kind of funny, but somehow the water is changed. Somehow it takes on some kind of characteristic which the human body can respond to if and only if there's a homeopathicity between the substance and that person's systems, so to speak. Um, I'll mention here that, you know, up until recently, science has been unable to make a distinction between just water and homeopathically prepared remedies. Now, I haven't seen the reason, I'm hesitating because I haven't seen this research yet, but I keep hearing discussion of it that supposedly there's research showing that some kind of nanoparticles are left in the diluent as things are made, as things are made. And um, which can be determined these days, and it's a big area of research going on. But you know, this idea of similar substances that can be used curatively is found in conventional medicine, in allergy treatments, and uh, preventively in um, immunizations. Um, it's not really a completely new idea. In fact, we would talk about this in medical school um, that substances can, given in small doses, have a different effect from substances given in large doses. Um, homeopathy is a rather extreme example of this. You know, it's interesting because the, the allergy doctors are usually kind of, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they don't want to be associated with homeopathy, but in reality, most of them are going out and they're making dilutions and they're giving them to people <laughs> and they're getting good response and helping the person's immune system stop reacting to it. It's, it's always kind of funny to me. Um, but what's, what's, so what's controversial about homeopathy? It's this you know, apparent size of the dose. People just don't believe that it can work. And this has been the case all along. People, they just don't believe that it can work. An extreme example of this, oh, somewhere around 1990, early 90s, there was an article published, I believe it was in Nature, the uh, scientific journal Nature, and it um, was a meta-analysis of all the studies that had been done on homeopathy up to that point, and they were extremely restrictive and careful about what studies they chose so as to eliminate studies which did not fit strict criteria, and they eliminated piles of studies in favor of homeopathy, and yet when the whole study was done, it concluded homeopathy works. 
it was published in the journal Nature, and in that same journal they published not one but two editorials describing, uh, which both said, gee, the study is flawless, we can't find anything wrong with the study on its own merits as a study. However, we know it, that we know homeopathy doesn't work, so this just goes to show that sometimes science is wrong. I mean, it actually said that right there in that same journal. It's like a belief system. People don't believe that homeopathy can possibly work, and so they will go to extreme ends to discount anything which goes in the favor of homeopathy. Okay, so the proven symptoms. So basically all the symptoms of a substance, including the proving symptoms, the known poisoning symptoms, and additional observations of different medicinal substances are collected together and called the materia medica in homeopathy. Um, so all the known symptoms that can be caused by a person, caused in a, in a healthy person, are called collected together and called the materia medica. You know, I'll mention this since it pops into my mind now. When the FDA was established in 1933, I believe it was, they were required by law, by Congress, to make not only a conventional pharmacopoeia of conventional medications, but also a homeopathic pharmacopoeia of homeopathic medications. And indeed, the, the, the HPUS, the Homeopathic Pharmacopoeia of the United States, is still maintained and regularly updated by the FDA, and all homeopathic medicines in the United States have to be made according to these FDA guidelines. Um, but this next point down here is extremely important. Original homeopathic work and books are still valid and useful. You know, can you imagine picking up a book for conventional medicine written in 1850 and trying to practice out of it? You would just kill people. It would be ridiculous. But you can pick up an old homeopathic book and use it. Not the slightest problem. They're not as complete as the new books. And the way they present information might be archaic, but the information is still valid. It's like a math book or a physics book. An old one's fine. They just present information differently and they might not be as complete, but they're still useful and valid. So in the Materia Medica, symptoms are organized according to body part or function. So when you open a homeopathic Materia Medica, it'll, it, for example, first it'll say some general things about that substance, then it'll talk about its mental symptoms, what substance it causes in the mental sphere, um, then it'll go through the whole body, starting with the head, talking about headaches, head symptoms, face, face symptoms, um, special senses, you know, hearing, touch, etc. Go through the digestive organs, reproductive organs, extremities, etc. and present the known symptoms of that substance. But most important are the symptoms which are unusual, peculiar, or unique to that substance. Something that's different. For example, I've got a few examples here. Let me just go on because I am actually getting a little short on time here, I think, for everything I've got to get done. Consider the remedy Bryonia alba. Um, the symptoms of Bryonia, its grand keynote is worse from any movement. Worse from any movement. It would be extremely rare to give Bryonia to a person who said, yeah, I feel better if I move around. A person who needs bryonia, almost irregardless of what they have, is going to want to lie perfectly still and avoid any movement. Um, they're also usually very irritable. They're usually thirsty for large amounts of drinks intermittently, and they're usually constipated. So this works from any movement. You see this a lot in inflammation of serous membranes. Serous membranes are, are a tissue in the body that often cover organs. For example, around the lungs there's the pleura. And if you if that gets inflamed, it's called pleurisy. And bryonia is almost specific for pleurisy. When people have pleurisy, it's like there's just like a spot where the the pleura, instead of sliding over itself very smoothly and in a slippery way so your lungs move in a frictionless way, it's inflamed and it catches. It's like a, it's like a sore throat. But it's like sticks. It stabs. It's a sticking pain. The people put their hand over it, trying to prevent it from moving. But every time they take a breath, it uh, it it moves. Same thing with the pericardium, bursa. These are also serous membranes, and 
Brown is a very common remedy in those in inflammation in those areas also. But this is also true if, if a person has a cough, a bryonia type cough, they don't want to move. A bryonia type headache, they don't want to move. A bryonia type sinusitis, they don't want to move. So that's that's, that's the a, a very strong symptom of bryonia, a general symptom of great significance. And usually you'll find confirmatory symptoms in one of these patients. Usually they're irritable, usually they're thirsty for large amounts, usually they're constipated. But virtually always worse for movement. So those so those unusual and unique symptoms are often critical. Um, another example here, homeopathic ipecac. Um, right, ipecac causes vomiting. But uh, if you want to cure vomiting with homeopathic ipecac, it has to be the same type of vomiting. Now, this is a new idea for most of us. I mean, right, vomiting means the contents of your stomach comes out. It's like, what do you mean the same type? What other type of vomiting is there? In ipecac, ipecac's an herb that kind of, you know, has one of its symptoms, its poisoning symptoms, actually, you could call it, is that it produces an extreme nausea. And this nausea is not relieved by vomiting. You know, most of the time when people vomit, well, after they vomit, they feel better. Their, their nausea is relieved. But not so with homeopathic ipecac. Also, for example, their tongue will be clean with homeopathic ipecac. If they're vomiting, they don't have a coated tongue. So there's, you have to look at the specific symptoms of the individual. You can't just look at the fact that the contents of their stomach is coming out and go, oh, 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 oh ipecac ought to work homeopathically. No, it's got to be the same type of vomiting. Many, many substances can cause vomiting. Now, a few points here that really need to be made. Homeopathy is extremely safe. It's extremely safe in children. Um, it's, it's really, when children are treated homeopathically, their immune system gets stronger over time because it stimulates the body to heal itself as opposed to if you give them too much conventional medications their immune system actually gets weaker over time and they keep getting sick more and more. When I see kids who are sick usually I have to get them through an illness or two homeopathically and then they're strong and they stop getting sick after that. Common remedies here, to use this example again, are, uh, understanding remedies are chamomile and pulsatilla. Pulsatilla the, those who need pulsatilla are real weepy and needy. They want to be carried all the time, and they they want to you know they feel better if you walk them up and down in the open air. The the child needing chamomile also wants to be carried, but they're really irritable, and they're thirsty and they're hot, and lots of times one cheek is bright red. It's very peculiar, but I've seen it many times. When you I suppose you hear a kid in the other room crying, if you hear the pulsatilla kid crying. Your most your your reaction will probably be oh somebody should pick that kid up. If you hear the chamomile kid crying, you're like somebody shut that kid up. You know it just puts your nerves on edge. They're very irritable. So you pay attention. You learn to pay attention to that kind of stuff in homeopathy. Now homeopathy is also completely safe in pregnant and nursing mothers. I cannot emphasize that enough. It is safer than even vitamins in pregnant and nursing mothers. It is very safe and it should be the first thing that a, that a pregnant or nursing mother thinks of um, for treatment if they need some kind of treatment. And it can be used in childbirth often with extreme effectiveness. Um, it can also be safely used in conjunction with conventional medications. Um, you don't have to stop your homeopathic remedy if you need some conventional medications. They can be mixed. The homeopathic medicine might not work as well, and but it won't. They won't. There won't be any drug-drug interaction. Um, one caveat is that sometimes the dose of the conventional medication will need to be lower, which is usually good. But you just kind of need to watch that. You know, if somebody's diabetic, for example, and they get a good homeopathic response, they may not need as much insulin, and they might, if if it's not lower, they might start to run into it low blood sugar episodes. So in homeopathy, it's not hard to help people with common acute illnesses. You can learn how to do this really easily. Um, there are lots of good books on home and family care. Most of them have the same information, it's just presented in different ways. 
Uh, so you just pick up a book if you like the way it's organized and it works for you. You just start using it. And how these books differ is that instead of having you know hundreds and thousands of choices for as a professional does, it limits it to the to the most common remedies for that illness, like ear infections. You know, it'll, it'll present the four or five or eight remedies that are most commonly indicated, and you'll be able to help 85, 90 percent of, of people you see, for example. So, so they're good. I encourage people to do that, especially if you have kids. Treating people with chronic illnesses, however, is uh, is a little trickier, um, and uh, it requires more training and expertise. I'll, I'll just put it that way. Now, homeopathy is used throughout the world. In America, it is so behind the scenes. Um, there's so few of us. You know, the, the first medical, national medical professional society in America, founded two years before the AMA, it was the American Institute of Homeopathy, which I am a, it's still around, I'm a member of it. Um, but there's not that many of us, you know, there's, there's bazillions of people in the AMA. There's just a relative handful of us. But throughout the world, homeopathy is a different status in different places. For example, um, in 1990, I went to India, and I was working in a little bit in different hospitals and clinics. And one of the places that I visited was the Infectious Disease Hospital in Calcutta. And this is the largest infectious disease hospital in, in uh, Asia. Um, the, the director of it, it's a very prestigious conventional medical post to have. And he was a very nice fellow. Gosh, I saw the diphtheria ward. I've never seen the diphtheria case in America. I saw 20 of them in one day there. I saw rabies. Uh, yeah, there was a kid with rabies, dying of rabies. Tetanus, they had a tetanus ward. Learned all kinds of stuff there. And then after we, after we visited him that day, we, uh, after we visited him that day, uh, he took us over to his house and we were having, um, you know, some juice there and talking, and he said, oh, you know, my wife, she's also a medical doctor, and uh, she's having uh, arthritis, but we're treating her with a system that you don't have in America. It's called homeopathy, and homeopathy can actually cure this type of, of disease and not just treat its symptoms. So my point is, homeopathy has a very different status in different parts of the world, and in India, is a prime example where it's it's really part of the whole health national healthcare system. It's very big there. There's a lot of homeopathic doctors. They're well recognized and mostly well respected. Um, oh, one other thing I'll say here: the Queen of England, her personal physician has been a homeopath since the time of Queen Victoria, and that's true to this day. The royal family's into homeopathy, and um, they live forever. And uh, one of my patients once came in because she said, oh, I had Prince Charles on one of my flights, and he told me about homeopathy, so I've got to try it. Okay, so let me summarize now. Choosing a useful remedy requires considering the whole patient. And both medicinal substances and diseases cause symptoms of the whole person. So medicinal substances cause symptoms, diseases cause symptoms of the whole person. So in homeopathy, you're simply matching up the similar symptoms of the whole patient to the symptoms caused by a potential medicine, um, and as we say, like cures like. And I think I've made it very clear that you need to uh, look at things like the peculiar symptoms in particular. So homeopathy is safe in all ages and all conditions. It can be safely combined with conventional medications, so the dose of conventional medications may need to be reduced, as I mentioned. So homeopathy is a carrot, not a stick. You're eliciting a response without forcing a change in patients in both acute and chronic illness. Whoops. Okay. And. Um, I wanted to give, I see I'm about, I, 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 this is the end of my talk here. Um, I was going to give a few examples here, uh, a few more interesting examples, but I think we should probably switch over to the questions here if there are questions. If there's not, I'll go ahead. So are there... Um, Hi, Tim, or Dr. Dooley. Yes, we do have quite a few um, great questions if you're, if you're ready to um, answer a few questions. Please. 
Okay. Um, so our first question is from Donna Caldwell, and she would like to know, is the concept of homeopathy similar to the concept of vaccinations? I assume she probably means in the way like cures like. Yeah, you could. You know, it's interesting because Hahnemann was alive when Jenner was alive, who was the person who started inoculating people with cowpox to prevent smallpox. And, you know, smallpox is the, you know, it's, it's the um, great success of the whole immunization concept. Smallpox is a terrible disease and has been completely wiped out um, uh, using vaccinations. And for that reason, it kind of deserves everybody's respect. Um, but I consider vaccinations to be a subset of homeopathy where you're using larger doses. And because of those larger doses, though, you, you do get side effects and uh, they can, in my opinion, be overused and they can cause bad reactions in some people. But I do consider it a kind of subset, a kind of crude subset of homeopathy. I, I hope that answers the question, Donna. Wonderful. Yeah, and we actually had a similar question um, Elizabeth wanted to know what's the difference between uh, difference or likeness between vaccinations and the homeopath homeopathic approach um, to elicit a change in the body's ability to fight infection. I didn't know if you wanted to, since we have two questions on the topic, I didn't know if you wanted yeah, go further. Yeah, I could say a few more words. Uh, let me say a couple more words on it because historically also homeopathy is used um, as a preventive measure also in certain epidemic diseases. You know, homeopathy, for example, people don't realize this. There's so much to say. In 1918, during the terrible flu epidemic, it's a matter of public health records that homeopaths and homeopathic hospitals had a death rate of like 1 to 2 percent. And conventional medication, which was pretty weak in those days, had a death rate of around 25, 30 percent. Um, and homeopathy can be used for short-term um, increased resistance to disease. If there's something that's going around, you can take, like for example, a lot of people take homeopathic influenzinum, which is basically homeopathic prepared flu virus, during the flu season just to increase their resistance. It doesn't give the same type of immunity that you can measure in the blood with immunoglobulins, but you see far less of those people will get the illness. So there's a little bit of overlap there. Interesting. Wonderful. Okay, so our next question comes from Denise, and she would like to know, how would homeopathy be used to support cancer? I, I don't know if I caught the whole question. Used to support cancer? Is that what you said? Right. You uh, To okay. treat or um, work in okay. yeah, conjunction with other cancer treatments. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I, this is really very interesting. Um, I, one of the cases I was going to talk about, just because it was such an, a fascinating case to me, was a woman who came in about seven, eight years ago with uh, metastatic breast cancer, where she had had every treatment under the sun, and basically the conventional doctor said at that point, you know, there's really nothing more we can do. This is all over your body. It's in your liver. I'm sorry, but, you know, there's, there's nothing more we can do. And she came in. And I used a, a new protocol in homeopathy, a, a way of dosing, and I treated her. Um, and this was the first time in my career this happened, where then a couple of months later she got an MRI and she was completely clear. Her body completely turned it around in two months. Everybody was floored. Nobody could wow. believe it. Even I couldn't believe it. It was stunning. And um, she stayed well for about two years. And this was so interesting. Then she came in and she was wearing really expensive clothes. She had always worn more uh, not expensive clothes before. And she, st and she was wearing this fancy hat and she had moved into this expensive house. And I said, oh, wow, I didn't know you had you know, so many resources financially. And she said, oh, yeah, I've, I have this, that. Well, it turns out it was from her mother's estate and she was basically stealing money from her family. And her family took her to court and her cancer came back and she died. And it was just... I felt like she killed herself by doing something kind of evil and wrong. It was it was such an interesting mm -hmm. case, but it also for numerous reasons. I, I but to get back to the real question here about cancer, I don't consider cancer in my practice as a primary. Excuse me, I don't consider homeopathy as a primary cancer treatment. 
There are doctors in different parts of the world who specialize in cancer with homeopathy. I get pretty darn good results, though, as part of the team, so to speak, treating cancer patients. And I have many cancer patients who swear up and down that they started doing much, much better when they saw me, and they come back year after year to keep going. So I hope wow. that answers. Wow, what an interesting, what a crazy story. Yeah, definitely, what a crazy story. I, th I think definitely how you're, you know, living your life def certainly affects your immune system. And your, um, very interesting. Um, okay, so our next question comes from Frankie, and he would like to know, what would be the benefit of using 6C versus 30C? Okay, um, this is very interesting. You know, it, when you go to the store, the typical potencies you see are 6C, 30C, 200C. These were the classic potencies that you'd see. And I'll mention this because one day, it always drove me crazy. How did they come up with this? Why 6? Why 30? If you, I, you know, I think Hahnemann just started with 30, and then people found as the years went by that going from 6 to 30 was a good step, and going from 30 up to 200. I mean, why didn't they go to 54, which would be, you know, 24 more, just like 6? If you plot these potencies on logarithmic paper, you know, log paper that you use in science, like chemistry and stuff, it's the distance from 1 to 10 is exactly the same distance as from 10 to 100, and the next cycle is 100 to 1,000. If you plot the homeopathic potencies on log paper, they're exactly the same distance apart. The distance from 6 to 30 is like exactly the same as 30 to 200 is exactly the same as 200 to 1,000, which are the most common lower potencies, or you know, not all low potencies, the most common potencies used historically. And which makes sense because biological, many biological functions in the world work this way. They work according to logarithms. Um, and lots of electronic things work according to logarithms. I, I, you know, this, this was just found empirically. That's how they picked these potencies. Nobody took a log paper and said, oh, let's try this. So they just did it empirically, and those were the things. It depends on the person. In general, where you're getting a good homeopathic response, a higher dilution actually works better than the lower dilutions, except Sometimes people over-respond to the higher dilutions, and they get worse before they get better. And that's one of the tricks with homeopathy. Not so much in acute diseases. You don't have to worry about it in acute diseases so much. It's mostly in chronic diseases. People will get worse before they get better. So also, the more physical the disease is, so to speak, the more pathological it is, you might want to repeat low potencies more frequently instead of going up in potencies, which can... So there's a bit of a, depends on whether it's an acute illness or a chronic illness, and it depends on what medications they're on and the status of the patient. There's many, many considerations in choosing potencies. But in general, the most important thing is to pick a remedy that they will respond to. And if you do, there's actually great flexibility in the potencies that you can choose. Um, if, if somebody's got bryonia symptoms, whether you give them 6C, 30C, or 200C, they should respond if they've got an acute uh, bryonia illness. Lots of times you repeat the lower numbers more frequently for the same response. But other than that's kind of a whole lecture in itself, but that's the general idea. Great. That's some really questions? interesting information. Yeah, we have um, quite a few, but I think we probably only have time for one more. Um, so this comes from Vinu, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Vinu. Um, but she would like to know, is it a it is proven that homeopathy cures perianal abscess or fistulas, but surgery does not. With homeopathy, there is no incision to be closed. After surgical intervention, there is no plan B to close the wound. My question is, is there anything in homeopathy that can help a person po with post-operative wounds? Let me know if you need to me yeah. to repeat any of that. No. Well, I, I, I think the summary at the end there hits mm -hmm. it there. You're, you're yeah. really looking for the post-operative care of people. Homeopathy is a wonderful post-operative tool. And um, you know, I, I'll digress for just a second. I can't resist this one also. When, when our youngest daughter was born, who's just heading off to college here next week, um, she... Uh, my, she had to be born by C-section in the end. We started at home, but they ended at the hospital. And after she was born, my wife wanted to nurse and so did not want to take uh, conventional medications. 
so that she could nurse. So I ran home and grabbed some homeopathic remedies. And the remedy that I thought would be best for controlling the pain would be Bellus perennis. But I also grabbed some good old Arnica. So she hid them under her pillow and took them. And it turns out that the Arnica really helped her with the pain. And she was, she was able her only post-operative medication after the surgery was Arnica. That's all she took. The nurse would pop in and go, would you like a Percocet? And my wife would go, no, I'm okay, thanks. And she'd go, well, how about a, how about a Tylenol? <laughs> you know, she wanted to give her something, you know? And my wife said, no, I'm okay. She, yeah. she, she, couldn't, she, couldn't, she, couldn't, she couldn't tell her the <laughs> Arnica was under the pillow. But, you know, the Bellus didn't work. But the Arnica did. It was very interesting. So that was a, that was a rather dramatic story as far as pain relief, but the same thing with, with closing wounds and things. Lots of times there is a remedy that will help with the wound closing up. Uh, and I mean, there's quite a few of them. And um, you know, there's, there's chapters in, in books on it, thing, but there's things like homeopathic calendula, sometimes arnica, sometimes hypericum, sometimes lead. And there's, there's sometimes silica, sometimes some of the cell salts you might know, like calc floor or calc phos. But anyway, there's, there's quite a few possibilities there. I hope that answers the question. I know that was a little vague, but other than saying, yes, there's there's some possibility there. It's a little too much to go into more detail. Do we have Great. time for that's any more wonderful. questions? Um, so that's about all the time. Um, we're actually just out of time. So I wanted to encourage everybody, if you do have um, more follow-up questions, we will post um, Dr. Dooley's email again in the chat there. Um, so if you have questions to follow up with him, and I can see that we have quite a few, um, feel free to email him and give him a little bit of time to get back to you. Obviously, the, a lot of these questions are um, require a bit of detail and um, re perhaps research, so thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Dooley. That was such a wonderful presentation um, and really uh, went very in-depth, so thank you very, very much. Um, and also, just so everybody knows, there will be an email which will go out tomorrow with a free recording of today's webinar. And if you enjoyed this webinar, you should consider looking into ACHS's accredited online courses and programs in homeopathy and complementary alternative medicine. There are a great op many options for anyone who is just starting out, such as our NAT 204 Energetic Modalities um, 2 Homeopathy Online. Um, and we also offer a certificate in homeopathy consulting and a wonderful master's program in CAM and continuing education options for anyone seeking to deepen their knowledge of holistic health and wellness and homeopathy even further. So you can give us a call at 800-487-8839 or email admissions at achs.edu and we'd be happy to chat with you about your holistic health goals. So thank you again, Dr. Dooley, and thank you everyone for attending this webinar. We host webinars about once a month. So if you enjoyed today's presentation, keep an eye out for future invites. And don't forget to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash achsedu and follow us on Twitter at achsedu for future webinar announcements, college events, and holistic health news.